Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for Estate Planning with Crypto Assets presented by James River Law. Today, we're going to go over a brief introduction about James River Law and the services that our attorneys here provide, as well as a little bit of general information about cryptocurrency. Then we're going to get into the importance of custodying and how to properly custody your crypto assets in a way that will keep them protected. Then we will talk about the actual planning of transfer of your crypto assets upon your, your death or incapacity. And then we'll discuss the pros and cons of utilizing trust to hold and administer your crypto assets. And then finally, we'll go through a bit of hypotheticals and some Q&A, and then we will close up. So before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Ryan Glazer. I am the estate planning and administration attorney here at James River Wall. And I'm joined with our managing attorney, Alex Mejias. Alex? Hi, how's it going? I'm Alex. Um, I focus on uh, the business side of the house along with uh, cryptocurrency being really the, what I spend the majority of my time here doing. And I work with Ryan. Um, we kind of collaborate on uh, estate plans that involve cryptocurrency here. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today um, to talk about this really important and growing topic. So now we're going to get started. And just some general information. The primary goal of crypto estate planning is to ensure that you're able to secure your crypto in a way that it doesn't get lost or stolen because as um, many of us probably already know, crypto is particularly prone to being lost because it is not uh, centralized. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and so it's important that you create a plan to allow you to be able to safely and efficiently pass your crypto holdings or hodlings on to your next generation so that they can enjoy and experience the full benefit of this life-changing asset that you've worked so hard and done, you know, hours of research and trading and, um, you know, dealing with exchanges and, and keeping up with the trends and things like that. The, the secondary goal is going to be for anyone that has significant holdings of crypto. Um, it's important that we figure out the best tax planning tools and asset protection tools that we have to ensure that we can minimize any type of tax burden that um, may be attributed to your crypto, as well as uh, protecting it from any potential claims of creditors of you or anyone that you're planning on gifting your crypto to. For an example, you know, just going off of the fact that I just said crypto is particularly susceptible to being lost, this is kind of a, a major statistic that uh, 3.7 million Bitcoins are lost forever, and that means forever. Um, at today's value, that's about 160 billion. Um, and honestly, that might be, it's probably a little bit higher today because crypto um, has increased uh, as of recently um, in value. It's been going up, but you know, it's a volatile market. So now I'm going to let um, Alex take over and discuss the importance of custodying with you. Thanks, Ryan. So one of the challenges with uh, crypto and estate planning is that um, it involves both legal issues, which and Ryan will get into these a little bit later, and also technical issues, because it's not just that you need to pass it on in a way that works within the frameworks of the law and estate planning, but you also very practically need to be able to give those assets um, to to someone else. And as Ryan mentioned, you know, you may have spent hours and hours working on it and uh, and you understand it in a way that, you know, your heirs or your loved ones might, might never understand it. So when we talk about custody, um, we're talking a little bit more about the technical side. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and so custody really refers to how you store your cryptocurrency. Um, and, and the reason why this matters is because there are two 
sort of broad categories of threats. Obviously, this is not a comprehensive list, but just in general, there are what we would call sort of external threats of someone hacking your computer or you know phishing for your password, um, and and being able to steal your uh, your cryptocurrency or your crypto assets. Um, freezing, like either like an exchange or, or some other um, governmental actor, um, and, and then also seizure. So um, there are these external threats when when you, when it comes to crypto, crypto. But then there's also kind of loosely what we call kind of like these like self sabotages. If if you lose your pin or your password or you can't find your device, um, you know that that effectively uh, translates to you you losing um, your crypto because. Uh, and we hear these stories all the time of, of folks who have lost a hard drive or who forgot the pin and, and there's, you know, they have one try left before the, the device is permanently locked. And those are sort of the horror stories and the things that keep us up at night. So our goal is to kind of make sure that none of these things uh, will happen to you. Um, so when you talk about custody, again, we're going to just do a really brief um, technical overview. And we have some other videos and, and you can find lots of information online about this if you're not familiar with it, but essentially um, crypto, almost every cryptocurrency is held in what's called a wallet. Um, I really like uh, the analogy of more of like a keychain than a wallet, um, because really what a wallet does is it holds keys. Um, for every crypto address, uh, for every wallet, there's two basic components, which is a public key, which is a basically a, alpha, a long string, an alphanumeric string um, that you can publicly, you can give out to other people. And this is sort of tells people where to send um, the Bitcoin to or, or the ETH to. Um, and it's sort of like your mailing address. And then uh, it's paired with a private key, which is your official digital signature. And the private key is what allows you to move the Bitcoin um, and send it to someone else and to control the Bitcoin that's associated with that public key. So one private key can actually produce multiple public keys um, and control all of those keys. And so a wallet is really what controls, is what holds that private key for you. And that is the most critical um, component. Um, and as the saying goes, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what that looks like. Um, just want to give a quick uh, overview of old school, uh, and this sort of demonstrates um, really at its most basic level what a crypto wallet is. But back in the day, um, there was this concept of a paper wallet, essentially, which was uh, literally a piece of paper um, that had on the left side um, on that bitaddress.org image, uh, your public key, and that which you could share. And then on the right side, uh, a private key, which was your secret, um, which is kind of hilarious that you just have this, you know, piece of paper with your secret key on it. Um, but that's how, um, you know, cryptocurrency moved in the early days. And, and at its most fundamental level, this is what a wallet is. It's a public key and a private key. And, and like I said before, there could be multiple public keys associated with one private key. Um, today, um, wallets look very different. Um, and there are two big categories of wallets, what we would call custodial wallets and non-custodial wallets. Um, custodial wallets are, are wallets that are essentially held by a third party. They're not in your custody. You're, you're giving custody to someone else, so, which means they are holding the private keys. So you cannot actually move that Bitcoin uh, for instance, they would have to move it. They would have to sign the transaction to move those Bitcoins. So when we talk about custodial wallets, we talk about mostly exchanges. So uh, non-US exchanges, US exchanges or applications, and then online, uh, what are called hot wallets, which are essentially like a third party um, allows you to you know, have a, an account with them, a, a wallet with them, but they still hold the private keys. Um, and when you think about a custodial wallet, they do have like a higher external risk because you know they are in control of your keys. If if they get hacked, um, your crypto could get lost. If they go out of business, your crypto could get lost. If a regulator comes along and shuts them down or decides to seize all of their assets, that could affect um, your crypto. So um, you know a lot of a lot of folks, particularly more hardcore and old school folks you know, would never ever keep any substantial amount of, of crypto on an exchange for that very reason. Um, but there obviously, as we'll see later on, there may be some reasons to do that. Um, they have a lower self-sabotage risk. Obviously, you can't 
you know, you're not really losing anything and there's a third party um, that if you were to, you know, say lose your password, there's a process for going about, um, you know, going through their forgot your password process and so that you can access those, those funds. So it does have, have a much lower risk of self-sabotage. Um, when, we, when we talk about non-custodial wallets, we're talking like, um, like certain types of browser-based wallets, something like MetaMask, um, a mobile wallet you can download on your phone. And then, you know, uh, and then there are also desktop wallets like Electrum uh, or Exodus that would sit on your computer. And then hardware wallets are, are basically um, little devices that are like USB drives that can disconnect, that you can obviously disconnect from the internet. And, the, and that's sort of known as what's called cold storage because it's not uh, connected to the internet. Um, and you can either have a single signature wallet or a multi-signature wallet, which actually requires more than one uh, private key to, to move the funds around. So these um, have a much higher risk of like self-sabotage because you it's all, it's all on you to make sure that you keep um, the, the keys secure, the, the passwords secure, the pin secure, the device secure, um, but there's a lower external risk. So uh, uh, just a few examples of non-online, non-US online exchanges are hit BTC, Qcoin, but there are many others. Um, US best base exchanges are Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken. There's FTX. There's a lot. There are lots. There are lots of exchanges. I think Bi you know Binance recently released a product for the United States. Um, so one thing uh, to just to be aware of, um, if you're if you're holding your crypto on a non-US uh, exchange, just understand that if anything goes wrong, the US courts typically will not have jurisdiction over that company. Um, you will have to go to their country and you're subject to their rules and their jurisdictional rules. So again, it's just something to consider uh, before keeping any substantial amount of money on an on a overseas exchange. Um, some of the browser-based non-custodial wallets are MetaMask, uh, Phantom Wallet, which is uh, for Solana, Uroi, which is for ADA. There, there are others. Um, some of the big uh, Bitcoin wallets, I'm, I'm a big Bitcoin person, so mobile wallets are Green Wallet, Samurai, Blue Wallet, Trust Wallet holds a lot of different types of uh, assets. Uh, those first three just hold Bitcoin. Uh, these are a couple examples of uh, hardware wallets, just to give you a, a sense of what those look like if you've never seen one of these before. Um, two of the big companies are Ledger and Trezor, uh, also KeepKey is another large company. And you can see um, it's, it's really just almost like a, not like not quite a jump drive, but just something that connects um, with a USB uh, cable and then is accessed through um, some software that you put on your computer. Um, the way that you choose, um, we always encourage our clients to find a, their individual perfect fit. There is no one size fits all, and it's really based on three factors. So the value of your cryptocurrency, uh, the technical proficiency that you and your loved ones have, and then your overall timeline. So for instance, if you are not holding a lot of crypto and you don't have a high level of technical proficiency and you wanna be able to trade things, then ha having uh, your crypto on an exchange probably um, could make sense. Um, if you're holding a whole heck of a lot of Bitcoin, for instance, you know, 10 Bitcoin or, you know, 20 Bitcoin uh, that has, you know, it's worth quite a significant amount of money um, and you feel pretty comfortable with the technology and you want to hold it for a long time, then there's probably, it's probably a good idea to, to put it in some type of cold storage and in some type of multi-sig wallet. And the nice thing is that there are more and more services uh, that are coming online where it's sort of a hybrid between sort of like a custody and non-custody. So companies like Unchained Capital or Casa will actually allow you to sort of get the best of both worlds by setting up a, a, a multi-sig wallet where you control two of the three keys, but they have a backup um, that they hold on to for you as well, just in case anything goes wrong. Uh, but basically we try to fo follow three big uh, guideposts of like something secure, something simple and accessible. So nothing too fancy. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, you sort of use a common sense approach. So like, for instance, one pretty common, um, you know, structure, if you're holding uh, assets yourself is to have your assets on a ledger, um, which you keep maybe in a house, in your house on in a safe. Um, and then you have the backup seed phrases and pins stored um, in a second location either with a trusted party or even in a safe deposit box at a bank. Um, you know, and there are companies that are custodying the, that type of information now that are coming online. And so you can maybe find a third party custodian as well. 
Um, but even sometimes just a good old fashioned safe deposit box works and they're, they're not expensive. Um, you know, some are, you know, as cheap as like 50 bucks for a year. Um, and it's a great way of, of, of increasing your security. But that's obviously something that we would go into with our clients. So hit, hand it back over to you, Ryan. All right. Yeah, great. Um, so now let's talk about planning and what is an estate plan. So, well, first off, just generally, an estate plan is basically a plan that you put in place to determine and distribute your assets in a way that you would like them to be distributed upon your death, but also it plans for incapacity as well, both temporary and permanent. So uh, the modern estate plan encompasses, uh, you know, pretty much any type of situation that could arise when you're unable to act uh, for yourself. And specifically regarding uh, crypto and a must for hodlers or holders of crypto is these three elements. Um, and this is at a minimum. And the first one is going to be a specific bequest. And, and this is important because in your estate planning document, you want to make sure that you're distinguishing between a general bequest of tangible personal property and a bequest of any type of device that might be utilized to hold any sort of crypto, such as like Alex had just mentioned, some of those uh, USB-like password-protected devices, as well as any computer or smartphone um, that you utilize, because you don't want to have contradictory provisions regarding the transfer of your crypto and uh, the transfer of your tangible personal property, because typically cryptocurrency is going to be considered intangible personal property. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're specifically making gifts of your crypto, both um, as an intangible asset, but then also as its own specific tangible asset class as well, so that whoever you are providing with the power to hold and manage and distribute your crypto, that there are no contradictory clauses, and that they're able to have control not only over the crypto itself, but also over any type of device that you utilize to exchange or hold your crypto. And along with that, like I just mentioned, you want to also make sure that you are including the appropriate executory or fiduciary powers. Um, generally, this uh, falls under Rufata, put in place so that uh, fiduciaries will be allowed to access digital information on um, whoever they're holding the fiduciary or executory power for. And it's important because if without having these specific powers listed and put in place, referencing the appropriate codes um, and statutes, you're really up to the terms of service of the individual um, exchanges that you would be holding crypto on potentially. Um, obviously, this would not be the case if you are self-custodying or you and utilizing some sort of uh, cold storage device, but any type of exchange, you would be at the liberty of their terms of service and their regulations internally um, without having those powers expressed. And then finally, you want to have what we call a crypto memorandum, which is going to be a separate document from your um, primary will or trust. And that is really going to act as a guide for, you know, whoever you are giving the power to manage, hold, and transfer, transfer your crypto. Um, and holding basically um, outlining instructions for what they need to do and how they're going to do it. And the next slide is just more about a, your crypto memorandum or letter. And, and one important thing is that 
Um, you want to keep this separate from your pins, passwords, and keys, but you want to have it instructive to um, tell them not only maybe where they are located, if they're located in a third place, or who they're located with, if you have someone holding them for you, or for the person you're giving that power to. And you also want to name a trusted third party to help your loved ones. Um, this is generally because, in, in, you know, in our experience, Experience, at least it seems that there is typically one person in a family who is really gung-ho and interested and has delved completely into the crypto space and what crypto is all about. And then the rest of the family, really, it goes right over their head, or maybe they're not as technically inclined as the individual who has worked so hard to, um, you know, really build up this particular asset class. And, you know, so at a minimum, also, again, you want to have your crypto memorandum have name your cryptocurrencies and what they are and where they're located, whether that be on an exchange, a hot wallet or a cold wallet. Um, and you're going to want to let them know where any P, uh, pins or keys are located so that they are able to find and access those as well. Um, you also want to give them any type of credentials or um, if you have like a password um, manager that you utilize that holds all of your different passwords and things, you want to let them know what that is and where they can find that. And you want to also identify any type of device, like I mentioned previously, a tangible personal property, such as a, a separate cell phone that you may use, a USB or um, a computer, and not only the device itself, but where on the device they can find that information. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say too that, um, you know, we call it a memorandum. Some folks, you know, call it a letter to your, your loved ones. You know, it, it can look like however it, it, you, you need it to look. And I will say, you know, don't, don't let um, you know waiting on your estate plan to get done uh, stop you from going ahead and doing this now. I mean, I think that for for our clients, we we kind of help them put it together and and make it you know look good and guide them through the process. But it really, um, if you're watching this and you and you don't have an estate plan yet, or um, or you do, but you haven't done something like this, it can be as simple as, you know, writing a letter, um, and, and, or even just an, a spreadsheet, an inventory that says, you know, this is what I have, because, you know, chances are, if you are deep into the crypto space, you're holding crypto in more places than maybe you can even remember. And as, as you know, for me, I got involved with it in, in 2014, um, you know, and, and I've lost in, you know, that's a great way to lose stuff is, you know, you do a lot of different things and, and then you, you know, sort of forget about it and put it down for a while. So, um, you know, I've certainly fallen victim to that myself, but, um, I remember when I went to go do this, I, I, I didn't realize just how many different places, um, I had kind of tucked away different amounts of crypto. And then when you factor in things like DeFi and staking, um, it's really important just to make sure that like, if anything were to happen to you, that that doesn't get lost, um, particularly if it's sitting, if it's staked somewhere, um, and 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 need and there and there needs to be some action taken to kind of withdraw it from that staking contract and be able to kind of uh, turn it into to cash um, at some point if that's something that they would want to do. So um, just can't stress this enough that you know like at, at a minimum you know just make a list um, and and provide some instructions. But you know obviously we would love to help you really kind of uh, do this in a way that has like uh, all of like the best practices in, in place. And that's something that you know, we help our clients do. And before you leave this slide, Alex, I also wanted to just kind of piggyback off what you were saying, but also emphasize um, one important piece and that is the separate piece. So even if you do have a current uh, state plan and, and most of the uh, estate plans out there now utilize what is called a personal property letter or a personal property memorandum. And again, going back to what I, I mentioned earlier, you do not want to utilize that part of your estate plan to 
um, transfer your crypto. So Alex mentioned a ledger or you know something similar, but make sure that is on a separate document in its own letter or its own memorandum. Um, so don't try to include that into um, a personal property or tangible property memorandum that you may already have in your estate plan. Um, and also it's important that if you do have an estate plan um, or you're, you're working on an estate plan that you make sure that you don't include any of your um, pins, or passwords, or keys in your actual will document itself uh, because oftentimes for various reasons, wills end up being recorded. Um, and once it's recorded, it becomes public information. And so if you have your keys out there and some unscrupulous, you know, purveyor of public documents finds them and then they go online, they can transfer your crypto and before your heirs or a trusted individual is even able to do so. And again, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and because you know, crypto transactions are private um, and uncentralized, you know, it's virtually impossible at that point to ever track down or recoup. Yep. Yeah. And when he's and as I mean, obviously, as you all hopefully you all know you know, like, like you said, it is decentralized. There's no like Bitcoin incorporated that you can go and do a chargeback with. Um, so, and we've seen a lot of people, unfortunately, fall victim to scams. Um, and again, again, it can be very hard. There are some tools if people are stupid enough to, you know, use a U.S. exchange to, you know, maybe you can, you might be able to get that information, but if they know what they're doing, um, they can, they can move it around pretty quickly. Um, and, it, and it will be gone. So be, be very, be very, very careful with where you put that information. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about trust. There are two types of trust that um, are utilized in estate planning, a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust or irrevocable trust. And the revocable trust is also referred to as a living trust or an inter vivos trust, which means that it's a trust that's created during life. Um, and generally, uh, it would be a grantor or um, create a trust creator trust. So that means that whoever creates the trust is also acting as the trustee. So they still maintain during their life, the power to amend or modify the trust terms themselves, as well as to um, put assets into the trust, manage those assets, remove those assets from the trust to retitle them whatever um, they need to do during life. And then an irrevocable trust is a trust that is between a grantor or trust creator and a separate trustee. So with an irrevocable trust, you are um, completely getting rid of any ownership interest in the assets that you're placing into that trust. And then your named trustee, uh, uh, either a trusted uh, third party or maybe a professional fiduciary or trust company, they are then in control of the assets um, pursuant to whatever distribution scheme or rules that you have put in place in the drafting of the trust itself. So with a revocable trust, that's generally what people utilize and then have what is just called a pour over will to avoid probate. Um, and then generally that trust then turns into an irrevocable trust upon the death of the grantor or the trust maker. Um, and it does that because during life, as long as you maintain control over the assets within your revocable trust, the um, taxes uh, flow straight through. Um, and so it would still count um, as income for the individual grantor or trust creator. Um, so you don't see much um, in the way of uh, protection uh, from taxes. When you have a revocable trust, the protection really is only uh, comes about when that trust turns into an irrevocable trust upon death. And 
So that being said, an irrevocable trust created during life is also um, the one that would provide the most protections for any assets from tax consequences and you know, potential creditors and things like that. It also helps with spending down large estates that may be subject to the estate tax. So those are the two um, primary or major types of trust. Um, and then, the, of course, there are different varieties of each. But now we're going to talk about, you know, can you put a crypto asset into a first a revocable living trust? And then not only can you, but is it a good idea? And so yes, the answer is yes, you can put um, crypto assets into a revocable living trust. And it, as far as whether it's a good idea, there are pros and cons. And, and as these uh, assets become a larger part of people's portfolios and um, estate planning attorneys are having to deal with these assets more, of course, there is sort of two camps um, in regards to what they think is the best way and whether or not they think it's a good idea. So I'm gonna just kind of briefly go through the pros and cons. Basically, um, like I said, a revocable living trust is a great tool to avoid probate and can also be utilized in that same way to avoid crypto assets from having to go through probate. However, you're going to want to make sure that your trust instrument um, is very clear about distinguishing your trust uh, assets and your crypto trust assets um, from each other um, so that they are not grouped together. You're going to want to make sure that you have um, waived any potential um, issues that may arise from prudent investor laws because crypto assets are such a specialized and volatile asset and that they're not FDIC insured. So for um, many states and jurisdictions that have adopted the uniform prudent investor uh, codes, such as Virginia, for example, um, you know, it, you would have to specifically waive some of those um, provisions in order to allow your uh, trusted third party fiduciary or executor to be able to actually manage and invest those assets without making themselves subject to any sort of liability. Additionally, something that you would want to do um, is make sure that it or I, I guess you don't have to make sure that, but it's a good idea to um, include a surety payment. Um, most practitioners when drafting uh, trust and will documents today because of the um, usual appointment of a family member that is generally a trusted person, they go ahead and waive a surety requirement. And surety is basically, um, a payment of money so that any type of loss that is caused by the poor management or mismanagement um, of any type of fiduciary or executor or trustee, um, there is money there to um, hold them liable and then you know, make your estate whole again um, instead of having to actually go after that person personally on the estate and getting things a lot messier. Um, so that is something else that you're going to want to do. Um, it, it's also probably important that you consider uh, creating a separate trust or sub-trust specifically to hold the crypto assets because you may not want to waive, for example, the prudent investor uh, rules when it comes to your uh, other assets or financial account stocks, bonds, and things like that. You may um, likely only wish to have those provisions waived specifically in regards to your, your crypto assets. Um, and that goes with surety as well, because surety is going to be based off of the value of the assets. So you may want to waive it for your less volatile assets and um, not waive it specifically for whatever trust you establish um, with your crypto assets as um, an extra protection.
Um, so uh, going on to kind of the cons of um, using a revocable living trust. Well, the primary thing is uh, what Alex previously talked about, you know, not my keys, not my wallet. So um, coins and crypto that are held in a wallet are self-assigning by definition. So whoever has the keys is the owner and there's no one else that's able to make a claim in any sort of um, uh, meaningful way. Um, so basically a beneficial owner, so that's someone that you have assigned to be the owner or the beneficiary of your crypto will never ever actually be able to gain access or receive that crypto if they don't have the private key information or your um, trustee or fiduciary who's going to be distributing to them doesn't have that information. And so basically it would be like assigning um, a bag of cash or buried treasure to your trust um, and that you would basically just be writing, I assign to this person, Sally, my crypto to this trust, and you just write that on the outside of the bag, um, holding your crypto or cash. And um, if you did, what would stop the next person, hypothetically or theoretically, from coming along and just emptying that that bag of cash or that that bag in this analogy, um, that crypto, um, whether or not they are actually the rightful person. Now, this is a little different when it comes to coins that are held on commercial exchanges. Um, they are a little bit more protected and um, better situated for situations like this. Um, they pretty much can function like a regular bank other than the fact that they are not FDIC insured. So with crypto assets held in an actual exchange account, um, or with an exchange, it, it makes a little um, more sense to have them put into a revocable living trust. You know, we talked earlier about risks, um, and uh, there is a little less risk when you're trying to make a trust assignment. For, for these exchange accounts, you can actually create like an, they have institutional accounts where the account itself can be held in the name of the RLT. So that is, you know, a, a nice feature that, um, you know, if, if the custodial option makes sense for you um, and you want to establish a, an account in the name of your trust, whether it's revocable or irrevocable, you can you can actually do that with all of the all of the major US exchanges. Absolutely, absolutely. So and again, though, it would still be prudent, um, you know, to even taking in um, an exchange account and, and you know, having that put into a trust or, you know, titled that way, you would still probably want to consider utilizing a separate trust or a sub trust for that. Again, going back to the prudent investor rules and um, the surety ship requirements and things like that. Um, and then an irrevocable trust is the next one that we're going to talk about. And, and an irrevocable trust, like I said, is the one that provides the most asset protection and is going to provide the most um, tax benefits um, and reduction. Um, but it still also needs to be carefully uh drafted and you also have to think about the fact that you um, will ostensibly be dissolving yourself of any type of ownership interest in that trust. Um, but obviously if you have a large estate or you have significant holdings, you would you want to avoid that estate tax. Um, liability, then you can make your transfers in or transfer your wallets into the name of what is a, called a Wyoming directed trust now. Um, and this allows for you to continue to have control over the investment decisions as um, what they call a investment trust advisor. Um, which can also be accomplished through an investment committee or a private family trust company that you've established. And this is sort of a new um, 
drafting tool that is just recently been put into effect in Wyoming and is being utilized specifically in the crypto space for this particular reason. Um, and then, you know, as the trusted um, uh, investment trust advisor, you'd be able to basically whisper in the ear of the trustee of the irrevocable trust and have the capacity to get them to initiate a sale transaction or, you know, management um, uh, transfer for it of kind from crypto to crypto or cashing out um, for actual uh, dollars. And this allows you to get those tax savings that everybody is really, um, really looking for, and also allow you to maintain some control over the assets themselves so you don't have to feel like you are completely relying on a third person. Yeah, and just to jump in here, I mean, like, you know, we're, when we say, you know, a state tax, we're talking about, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So if you're, if you're holding, you know, as an individual less than $10 million, um, you know, this may or may not really make sense for you. But I think once you get over that, that point, that's when you begin to look at this. And there's a variety of all, you know, shapes and sizes um, of irrevocable trust that we don't really have time to get into today. Um, that could that could work for you. But just to kind of frame like the context around this in terms of like the, the actual dollar values. And, and there are a lot of folks who got in really early, um, you know, with a very low cost basis. And, you know, they're sort of accidentally or not accidentally holding, you know, millions and tens of millions of, of, of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency. So um, if you're in that boat, then, you know, definitely getting a, an attorney involved and, and, and really carefully thinking through um, your strategy is, is essential. And the last point I'm just going to make about trust, both the irrevocable trust and the revocable trust, and this is true for all assets, not just crypto. But one of the benefits of utilizing trust is that even during incapacity, your um, assets are able to be uninterrupted and won't become lost um, during that period of time. Um, and so the status quo can sort of be maintained um, during any type of incapacity. So not only are we talking about um, what's going to happen upon your death, but also if for some reason you're unable to manage these assets for yourself for a period of time. So now we're going to go into some hypotheticals, and I will go ahead and let Alex read the first one for us, and then we'll talk a, a little bit about it. So you want to take it away? Sure. Um, John is a crypto enthusiast who started buying Bitcoin and various altcoins on U.S. and non-U.S. online exchanges in 2015. So he's an OG. Um, mm -hmm. He is married and has two children. His children are in elementary school. John's wife is not very tech savvy, which is pretty common and has no idea how crypto works. John's crypto trading has yielded him crypto holdings worth over $500,000, um, probably more than that if, if, he was, if he got involved in 2015. Yeah. Um, one day while, while riding his motorcycle to work, John gets into an accident, unfortunately dies. He doesn't have a will and still holds his crypto on the exchanges and in a hardware wallet. So what happens... Um, to his crypto assets. So Ryan, what do you? So what do you the first, yeah. So the first thing I'm going to look at in this hypothetical is the fact that his wife is not very tech savvy and has no idea how crypto works. So we have to consider the sophistication um, and tech savviness of the potential heirs. And, you know, he has significant holdings at half a million dollars, um, probably a lot more today, um, especially like you said, if he started investing in 2015. Um, and then finally, I would look at the fact that, um, you know, he is holding them on both exchanges and on a hardware wallet. So first of all, because he doesn't have a will, we already know that his assets are going to have to be probated. So the crypto will have to be probated. So that is one thing that we would have to consider. 
Um, but then following that, and in order actually, and this is an important thing to say too, Alex, um, is that if you no know one has the keys um, to access crypto and it's lost, it's also no longer subject to probate. Probate can't, has because it's not actually titled anywhere or registered anywhere, um, it cannot be found or subject to probate. However, now the exchange is under some new laws and regulations. So if it's on an exchange, you have a better chance because um, you know, they are recording um, and reporting any um, uh, exchanges or trades that are over $10,000. So you at least will have a little cushion to find some um, uh, ledger or some record of it there. But, um, but that I think is important to say. Um, so what's going to happen to the crypto assets? Well, first, like I said, they're going to go through probate. Um, so they're going to be subject to the probate tax. The exchanges, I think that those will be safe because um, hopefully um, if it's on a U.S. exchange, then uh, John's spouse would be able to send the appropriate uh, qualification letter, uh, administrator qualification letter and a death certificate, and then they will then um, help her to access those funds. Now, regarding the hardware wallet, I think that might unfortunately end up being lost. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really possible um, that they could very easily be lost. Um, and even if she, she could find them, if she doesn't know how to, um, if she doesn't know how to open them, that's a problem. If she doesn't know how to, uh, how they interact with the software. So like, like I mentioned earlier, the hardware wallets actually, you know, you, you move the actual crypto around by, you know, look like, you know, bringing up a program and then the, the hardware wallet is just signing the keys. So she would have to know where they are. She'd have to know the pin. She'd have to know which software to use and then how to connect it all. And then from there, she would even need the further technical knowledge to be able to move it off of the hardware wallet to, to a place where it's useful to her or in some way. So you know, there's a really, this is a very bad place to be. So this is not where we want to see anyone. No, definitely not. So let's move on to the next one. I'll go ahead and read the next one here, hypothetical two. Matt and Kim were married in 2020. They decided not to spend a lot of money on an estate plan and used legal Zoom to draft a basic will. Boo! The will did not include any provisions related to the access of digital assets or provide information about cryptocurrency. Later that year, Matt began investing in cryptocurrency and had about half a million of crypto on Coinbase, a US-based exchange. And he also held another half a million worth of Bitcoin on a Ledger hardware wallet. Kim was not involved in the trades, but was aware that Matt had a large amount of money in crypto. Uh, one day while rock climbing, Matt fell off a cliff and died. What happens to his crypto assets? Well, Alex, what do you think? Yeah, so in, in this one, you know, it's a little bit better. There's a will. Um, you know, he would be subject, uh, she would be subject to the, like like uh, we mentioned earlier with Rufata, she would be subject to Coinbase's terms and conditions in terms of accessing any electronic information. And really they, they now, this was not the case in years past, but now they have a, a fairly streamlined process. Um, for being able to access those ass assets on the exchange, but she would need to provide proof. Um, you know, she would have to probate the will because she would have to be able to provide to Coinbase proof that she has been she's the official uh, personal representative of the deceased person. Um, so that will, will definitely need to be probated um, no matter what. Um, and then again, the, the same issue that we raised with the last hypothetical uh, regarding like the ledger wallet, that she would have all of those same challenges. So I think you know, this is a much better situation than the last one, but still there's a, quite a bit of crypto that could be at stake. All right, so Sally uh, heard about cryptocurrency from a friend and purchased some crypto in 2019. She purchased the crypto on a, China, a Chinese-based exchange where it sat for over a year. In late 2020, she moved her coins onto a hardware wallet and had an estate planning attorney draft a crypto memorandum with it. Good job, Sally. Um, the memorandum uh, provided the location of the crypto instructions and named a neutral third party. 
In 2021, she died, leaving all of her crypto to her husband, who is not familiar with cryptocurrency. So what happens to her crypto assets? This is best case scenario, sort of the gold standard. So it was a little iffy at first when she was on a China-based exchange, but she did the smart thing. Um, she had been holding it for a, a long period of time, and she decided to make the move into um, self-custodying it on a moving it to a hardware wallet. Um, and she also had the memorandum uh, drafted by an expert estate planning attorney and included all of the important information as well as naming a neutral third party to assist. So then when she passes away, her husband, who was not familiar with crypto, is able to contact that neutral third party, provide them with the crypto memorandum, and ideally none of her crypto will end up being lost. Yep. So yes, yeah, so this is really kind of where we would encourage people to get to a place where they they have an estate plan, they've you know they've secured their crypto, so you know, moved it from an insecure place to a more secure place. It's simple. It's in one place. There are instructions. So this is really kind of like Brian said, the gold standard. So um, I don't I don't believe we have any questions, um, but um, just in summary, again, you want to find your perfect fit. Um, you know, make a plan, get it together, um, get a trusted helper to help on the other side of things. And, um, you know, if you're interested in a trust, please uh, be sure to consult um, an estate planning lawyer and your CPA because there are tax um, implications as well. Um, again, watch out for scams. We say this every topic, no matter what. Um, there's so many different ways um, that we've seen folks who have, uh, you know, a friend's social media account has been hacked and all of a sudden, and they're posting about cryptocurrency when they never have before. Be careful. Someone contacts you uh, through social media and then they you know, strike up a relationship and then they start talking about trading. You know, be careful. Um, there, there's a lot of very sophisticated scams out there. Be sure that you're, you know, you're dealing with a reputable exchange um, and that you're not like contacting their customer service via like a WhatsApp account. Like that doesn't happen. So Red flag. be really careful out there. Um, Here's our contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Um, if we can ever be of help, we're always uh, happy to provide as much information as possible. Um, we'll, we'll also post this video to our YouTube channel where you can also find some other content uh, regarding estate planning and cryptocurrency. Uh, and uh, please do uh, follow us uh, so that you can keep up to date uh, with any uh, more videos uh, that we put out in the future. Ryan, do you have anything else to add before we, we, we jump off? Uh, really, the only thing I can think to add is that we do free estate planning consultations. So if you uh, want to reach out, I'd be more than happy to meet with you um, and talk to you about your estate planning needs, both generally and in regards to any crypto that you hold. So please feel free to contact Alex or myself um, and then, of course, follow us. And thank you for joining us today.